Today on the Matt Wall Show, a video of a white man being beaten with a brick in Baltimore is uploaded to Instagram with the caption, White Lives Matter. Uh, this is the latest apparently racially motivated assault on a white person. The media, of course, is ignoring it, but it's happening, and the reason why it's happening is clear. We'll talk about that today. Also, five headlines, including uh, Trump getting in trouble for speaking truth about BLM and Joe Biden having a mental breakdown on live TV. You have to see it. You really have to see the tape. And in our daily cancellation, I will cancel everyone who is currently trying to cancel Adele for her supposedly racist hairstyle. How can a hairstyle be racist? We'll find that out today. All of that and much more on the way. We begin with this. Uh, the city of Baltimore uh, lived up to its reputation yet again this weekend when a white man was beaten over the head with a brick as he walked down the street. It was all caught on film by another person who appeared to know that the attack was about to happen and laughed uh, when the victim was sent crashing to the pavement with a gash in his skull. Footage was posted to Instagram with the caption, white lives do not matter. As of now, the condition of the victim is not known. Last I saw, police arrived on the scene later to find only a pool of blood on the sidewalk. Um, now that I've described it to you, I'll, I'll play the video for you because no description can quite capture these sorts of things. So watch and listen to the reaction of the people filming. Now think about the mindset you must have to actually think that bludgeoning uh, a random guy as he walks down the street is funny. We're talking about violent sociopathy at the level of serial killers. Okay, not that the people filming the attack uh, or the attacker himself are serial killers, just that morally and psychologically, they're on that level. They, they take actual joy in witnessing brutality against the innocent. Now, as far as white people being brutalized, though, this is not an isolated occurrence. It was only two weeks ago that a white man was beaten unconscious by a Black Lives Matter protester in Por uh, Portland. Last week, a man in Colorado yelled, Black Lives Matter, before stabbing a white man in the lungs. That same week, a man in Georgia walked into an auto parts store and knifed a white employee, later confessing that he felt the need to find a white male to kill. Again in the same week, an elderly white man was knocked apparently unconscious after trying to stop looters from ransacking his business. This assault was met with approval by um, activist Tariq Nasheed, who baselessly labeled the victim a suspected white supremacist and celebrated his attackers as, quote, freedom fighters. Now, these can all be added to the growing list of assaults on white people over the last few months, which includes the white female beaten with wooden boards by a group of black men uh, during the riots, and uh, the 92-year-old white lady casually pushed to the ground by a black man as he walked past. She hit her head on a fire hydrant. And these are only the, the physical assaults we're talking about. We haven't accounted for the Black Lives Matter demonstrators screaming at white diners in D.C. or BLM activists elsewhere in the country engaging in all manner of harassment and intimidation, um, often explicitly aimed at whites. Now, we'll be assured that these cases are not numerous enough uh, to count as a trend or an epidemic, but I note that almost everyone who would make that dismissive argument, uh, argument about black on white violence will, in the next breath, insist that random videos of police officers shooting black men do count as both a trend and an epidemic. And we could be quite certain that if in the span of seven days a black man was kicked in the head and knocked unconscious by a white supremacist, and then there were two separate stabbing attacks carried out by white men screaming white lives matter, um, these same people would call you a racist in league with Nazis if you didn't conclude that black people are being hunted in the street all across the country. Indeed, we're already told that black people are, quote unquote, literally hunted, to use uh, LeBron James' phrase, by, by white people, even though the crime statistics clearly show that a black person is more likely to kill a white person than a white person, a black person. That's what the stats show. Now, whether you think these cases listed at the top equate to a trend or just an unfortunate series of oddly similar events, the main point is that they're not happening in a vacuum. Okay, when a group of people are cast as the villain and labeled an existential threat to other groups, and then members of that villain group wind up dead or beaten in quote-unquote random attacks or accosted by angry mobs, it is simply ludicrous to deny the obvious connection. In our culture, it is dogma that whites are all inherently racist, that they are privileged and have earned that privilege by stealing from other races. Note the uh, BLM activists 
demanding that whites give up their homes and the BLM leader in Chicago announcing that blacks can loot all they want because um, they're only taking what they're owed. Um, that's dogma. It's dogma that they enter, that uh, white people enter the police force so that they can stalk and murder black people for sport. It's dogma that um, white people should be ashamed of their past and their ancestral heritage, that the only thing they ought to feel about being white is guilt. This is a rough summary of critical race theory. It's been force-fed to college students for decades, preached from every pulpit, pulpit that the left has available to it, to include many church pulpits, by the way. Now, if you're a non-white person, and you take all of this, and you listen to it, and you take it seriously, and you especially notice that it's now considered normal and healthy to express racial resentments through violent outbursts under the guise of protest, then what else are you going to do? Believing that whites are racist by their nature and that everything they've done, uh, everything that they have has been in some sense earned unjustly or stolen, why wouldn't you attack and rob them? And if they're, quote unquote, hunting you or are in league with those who hunt you, then beating them senseless is practically an act of self-defense. It's what they deserve, at least, what they would have done to you. It's not that every non-white person buys this narrative. Obviously, most don't and most aren't doing these sorts of things. But when a message like this is being broadcast from every corner of the culture and powerful forces are working every day to advance this narrative and brainwash people, especially young people, into it, it's simply inevitable that it will persuade some. And then there will be others who are not necessarily persuaded, but are happy to use the excuse given to them to act out violently. You know, the rioters aren't necessarily angry at anybody. I doubt that most of them are sincerely convinced of the rightness of their cause as they burn and loot and steal. They do it for fun um, and because it's, a, it's an opportunity to get a new pair of shoes and a TV. And the narrative gives them the excuse they need. This includes, of course, other white people who consider themselves to be the good ones, and thus they have an excuse as well to assault and burn and destroy. Um, now, keep in mind that some of the people who, who committed some of the acts mentioned earlier are probably mentally ill. The guy who stabbed the white man and shot at Black Lives Matter, well, he waited for police to show up and then told them that uh, he's, he's, quote, I just stabbed someone, I'm a psychopath. Now, generally, if a man stabs another man and identifies himself as a psychopath, he probably is. But that only proves my point all the more. There are all kinds of people out there who, for one reason or another, will be susceptible to this villain narrative about a whole race of people. When, when, when they take the narrative to heart and act on it, the fault lies, with, lies without a doubt, at least in part, with those advancing that narrative. Now, if you want to know how bad it's gotten then consider not any example of violence already listed, but consider the simple fact that as I speak right now and talk about this subject, many in the audience are wincing. Not because they disagree, but because they're uncomfortable with this subject being discussed at all. That's where we are now. To simply make the statement that white people are being assaulted and killed, which is obviously true, and that this is bad, which is obviously true also, and that we're in an environment where there's a hyper focus on the real or imagined sins of white people, and that all of this must be logically connected in some way, which is again all obviously true. To make all of these obviously true observations is provocative and controversial. That alone tells you what you need to know. I mean, I was accused of race baiting because I posted that video of the of the white guy being beaten with a brick. Are we not supposed to even talk about it? It's race baiting to even bring up that a white guy was just bludgeoned with a brick while he was walking down the street. The point here is that claims of there being some sort of systemic conspiracy among white people to discriminate against and kill black people, claims that you know white cops are white supremacist murderers, claims that uh, white people living in the year 2020 owe restitution for sins committed by white people a century and a half ago, all of these claims, these are not mere virtue signals. These are not mere talking points. These are, especially at this point, as America descends every day further into anarchy and violence, these are incitements. These are calls to violence. These are cover for violent mobs. The rich and powerful people who tell these fables, they know what they're doing. And they sit in comfort, confident that the violence will never come to their doorstep until one day it does. Because a fire, if it gets enough fuel, can no longer be controlled. Let's get to five headlines.
You know, one of the worst things uh, about having car trouble, where there's nothing good about it, so it's all bad, but one of the worst things is, you know, you, you take the car to the mechanic and you're just waiting. You're waiting for that phone call to find out how much it's going to be. And it's always it's always worse than you imagined it was going to be. That's the way it works. And, and these days, computer systems and cars, you know, the new normal, from electronically controlled transmissions to touchscreen displays to dozens of sensors. Um, the problem is that you can't fix any of these new features yourself, okay? So when something breaks, it could cost a fortune. And now is not the time, especially for expensive repairs. That's why I have CarShield. CarShield has affordable protection plans that can save you thousands for a covered repair, including computers, GPS, electronics, and more. The people at CarShield understand payment flexibility is an absolute must, particularly uh, you know in recent times. So monthly plans can be customized to your needs with rates as low as $99 a month. No long-term contracts or commitments. CarShield gives you options that others won't. You get to choose your favorite mechanic or dealership uh, to do the work. CarShield takes care of all the rest. So it's, it makes it simpler for you and um, and a whole hell of a lot cheaper. Uh, this, this is just, it, and you know what else it takes away? It takes away the uh, anxiety as well of you don't have to worry. You know that you know, whatever whatever the cost is, you've got car shield, you got it covered. That's how I feel about having car shield. It's, it's great. So for as low as $99 a month, you can protect yourself from surprises and you can save thousands of dollars for a covered repair. Call 800 car 6000. That's uh, 800 car 6000 and start saving today. Okay. Um, well, here we go again. Protests in LA last night, more protests. This one started with BLM Los Angeles sending out this tweet here. Uh, it says, Los Angeles County Sheriff's killed a black man, Dijon, on 109th and Budlong and left his body face down in the dirt. We need all hands on deck. Please get here ASAP. Notice how there's no information about the circumstances of the shooting, just that somebody was shot. That's because it doesn't matter. They don't care. If police kill a black man for any reason, literally any reason now, they will riot. That's the way this is going. And so it doesn't matter uh, what the circumstances are. But as far as they go, um, just, just, uh, just, you know, for the record, as far as we know them anyway, right now, the suspect got into a fight with cops, punched the cops, had a gun at one point, produced the handgun and, uh, and then was shot. Still plenty of unknown details here, but, but based on what we know, there's of course no reason to be protesting. If there is a reason, then, then we don't have that information yet. Armed man physically assaults cops. Okay, that's the headline so far. Um, and if, if that's what happened, then guess whose fault it is when the armed man assaulting the cops gets hurt or killed? Oh, it, you know, and by the way, the cop who pulled the trigger appears to be Hispanic on top of it. Although we're told white Hispanic. You know, so we're, we're doing that trick again. There's a, he's a Hispanic, but he's white Hispanic. So we can still make this about white supremacy. White supremacy. Once again, though, you see how all agency and willpower is removed from the suspects in these police shootings. It's the way it always goes. You know, they assault cops, draw weapons, etc., and we act like they play no role at all in their own death. Like, they couldn't have been expected to not do that. But the thing is, you know, this is not a coincidence that almost everyone in America, white, black, any other race, who doesn't assault cops and use weapons on them, manages to not get shot by the police. Crazy coincidence, right? I don't think it is. Like, there's a there's a real connection here. I succeed in not assaulting cops every day of my life. I It's, it's you know, I, I just did it again yes, yesterday. I went through a whole day, didn't assault any police officers. And I also was not shot by any police officers. I really think there might be a connection. I got pulled over recently, and um, through the whole interaction, I actually did not at any point punch the police officer. I did get a ticket. But the thing is, if if I had decided to punch the police officer, there are basically two, you know, what would have been a ticket, now it's going to be different. I'll still get the ticket, but uh, if I'm still alive. But... When I, when I start that assault of the police officer, th- there's really only two directions that can go. One is me to prison, um, dealing with a, a much worse charge or, or infraction than what it would have been otherwise, or dead, you know, or in the hospital, paralyzed. I mean, those are really the only, it's like, once you start doing that, there's, there's no good result for you at all. 
I mean, there might be good results for the hacks and race baiters and charlatans out there who want to use your death or your maiming, your injury uh, to advance their own narrative and to sow, you know, more uh, division and everything. So for them, sure. But for you, no. This is like a really basic message that somehow gets lost. We forget to mention it. Okay, let's go um, number two. Uh, here's another thing you wouldn't expect, but big surprise here. People are upset about something that Trump said. Uh, they are. I know, really surprising. Uh, so let's take a let's listen to this. He was on he was in, on uh, Laura Ingram last night, and uh, then he you know he was, he was talking, and everything that he said was horribly offensive. This part right here was super offensive and upsetting, though. Listen to this. Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization. You remember pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. That was the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter. I said, that's a terrible name. It's so discriminatory. It's bad for black people. It's bad for everybody. And all of a sudden it becomes like sort of, although now if you look, it's going way down because people are tired of this stuff, what's going on, the Black Lives Matter. If you look at what's going on with the bats and the, the a lot of thugs. Running through thuggery. D.C. last night. Oh, it's terrible what's going on. My God, how dare you, Trump? How dare you say these things that are incontrovertibly and obviously correct? Yes, Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization. Their founders have said so publicly. Why are we still pretending that this is some sort of offensive? They've said it. Listen to them. They're the ones who we didn't say it. It's not our fault. I'd prefer if Black Lives Matter was not a Marxist organization, but it is. And that's what their own founders have said. So there you go. Um, now, now that we've checked in with Trump, let's see what uh, Biden is up to. COVID has taken this year, just since the outbreak, has taken more than 100 years. Look, here's the lives. It's just, it's, I mean, you think about it. More lives this year than any other year for the past 100 years. Okay, I have a transcript here, um, if you didn't follow that. The, the transcript is, COVID has taken this year, just since the outbreak, it's taken more than 100 years. Look, here's the lives, it's just, it's just, think about it, more lives this year than any other year for the past 100 years. I'm not trying to be funny, I really have no idea what he's even trying to say there. I, I can't decipher it. This isn't one of those times where somebody stumbles or has a gaffe, and you kind of know what they were trying to say, but you pretend that you don't, just just to try to, just to, uh, you know just to dig the, um, dig the knife in deeper. I, but no, this is not that. I really don't even know what he was going for. It's taken more lives than at any other point in the last 100 years. Is that what he was trying to say? COVID-19 is a new thing. It hasn't been around. So I don't know what that means. And just so you know, what you saw there, you know, because um, it's tempting when you see these kinds of things with Biden to say, well, look, he had a brain fart. It, you know, he stumbled over his words. Everybody does it. Um, yeah, everyone does. I mean, I've had many brain farts in my day. Uh, I have a particularly flatulent brain in that way. And uh, I stumble over my words all the time. But something like that, that's not normal. That is just not normal. To complete, in the middle of a sentence, you completely lose everything you were going to say. And it's especially not normal when it happens all the time like it does with Joe Biden. Uh, number four, J.K. Rowling, still suffering the consequences of publicly acknowledging that biology exists, has now given back her Robert F. Kennedy Ripple of Hope Human Rights Award, which is good because now they have an extra one lying around, so now I can finally win it, you know. Um, but she gave it back after the president of the organization, Carrie Kennedy, came out and attacked Rowling for believing that men can't get pregnant. Very, you know, obviously very offensive thing to believe. And uh, so I'm reading now from Forbes, it says, Carrie Kennedy published uh, a statement this month to the RFK Human Rights website displaying multiple statements made by Rowling in recent months and saying, um, on, uh, and, and, uh, and th okay, this is what she said. No, I'm losing track of what I said. No, I'm pulling a Biden. Uh, so this is, this is Carrie Kennedy. She says, I have spoken with J.K. Rowling to express my profound disappointment that she has chosen to use her remarkable gifts to create a narrative that diminishes the identity of trans and non-binary people, undermining the validity and integrity of the entire transgender community. Trans rights are human rights. J.K. Rowling's attacks upon the transgender community are inconsistent with the fundamental beliefs and values of RFK human rights and represent a repudiation of my father's vision. Um, okay. Can I just say, if someone's opinion 
somehow undermines the validity and integrity of your very existence, then you might have issues that go way beyond that opinion. I, in my life, have never felt that the validity of my existence was undermined by anyone's words or thoughts. And I've been insulted many times, I assure you. I, I have many very horrible things have been said to me. Um, I would wager, in fact, that I have heard more horrible things said to me and about my family than the average transgender person has heard in their life. I, I, I think I can feel pretty confident in that. Um, but in, in any case, it, and sometimes it, it, it ticks me off, it's annoying, I don't like it. I've never felt that the validity of my existence was undermined. I don't even know what that means. I exist, I'm sure of that. I don't, need the, I don't need my validity or the integrity of my existence to be affirmed by anyone. So this constant need for affirmation, this panic um, that you see you know, uh, from LGBT activist folks, the, the way they panic, if, anywhere, if, anywhere, if anyone anywhere says anything that LGBT activists don't like, um, the fact that they always need everyone all the time to validate them and we'll try to destroy anyone who fails to provide that validation, that might speak to some deeper things going on. I don't know, just a thought. You know, if you feel like you need your existence, your very existence, and what was it she said? The integrity, the integrity of the entire community. If you feel like you need your existence to be validated and the integrity of your community validated, whatever that means, then again, I would say maybe there's some deeper things going on. Okay, five. Finally, for our most important story of the day, residents of an Alabama town are being terrorized by a goat who eats their mail. Um, this harrowing footage was uploaded to Facebook. Uh, you can take a look at it here. There's the goat. There he is, that bastard. Look at him. That's a federal crime, by the way. This is not a joke. There could have been a coupon for 10% off a new mattress in there. Now that's gone. It, that, that's, he's stealing money. That's money out the window. And let me tell you, there's a reason that goats have always been considered satanic. They eat your mail. They have weird looking eyes. They, they do other things. I mean, you may be wondering why I take the goat issue so seriously. And you may wonder why I'm still talking about it right now. And you may be thinking, Matt, the goat joke is over. Move on. Well, I'll tell you why. Because my wife has been recruiting my children. My children, my own flesh and blood, has been recruiting them. And together they have been waging a pressure campaign against me for months now to get me to consent to buying a goat. This is a serious thing now in my family. They want a goat. I don't know why. The other day my, my daughter came into the living room, started talking about the goat. Oh, daddy, can we get a goat? I see my wife behind the door, like feeding her lines. Okay, it's a conspiracy. But I'm not going to have this mailbox tampering scumbag anywhere near my home. That's all I'm saying. So goats are canceled. Uh, that was a pre-cancellation before we get to the main cancellation of the day, which we will do in just a second. But before we do that, I want to tell you about Omaha Steaks. Uh, look, my family has loved Omaha Steaks for a long time now. And the great thing about Omaha Steaks is, is you know, the product that they send to you. It's so good that it can make, even if you're not a great cook, I mean, I happen to be a brilliant cook, but if you're not, it can even make you seem like a brilliant cook just because the meat is that delicious. Right now, Omaha Steaks is offering a steakhouse a grilling package with an exclusive offer just for my listeners. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter a Code Walsh into the search bar, and this week, Omaha Steaks will add four burgers and four gourmet jumbo franks free with your order, okay? To reiterate, uh, four free burgers and four franks. And by the way, I've had their burgers. Uh, they are absolutely delicious. It's called the Grand Summer Grill Out Package, and it lets you stay at home and eat like you're at the best steakhouse in town. We're talking Omaha Steaks, bacon-wrapped uh, filet mignon, plus pork chops, chicken, much more. All of that delivered to your door. And it makes it, it makes it exciting. Make sure the goat isn't out there. Okay, that's another thing. You gotta be careful there's no goats in the vicinity. That's one thing they'll definitely steal. Smoky sweet bacon, fork tendered uh, filet mignon, all for much less than going out to a restaurant. Visit omahasteaks.com, type Walsh in their uh, search bar to get this today. Again, go to omahasteaks.com, type Walsh in the search bar and get this deal today. All right, let's get to our daily cancellation. 
Today, for our daily cancellation, I will be canceling all of the cancelers of the British pop star uh, Adele. Adele is the latest white celebrity to get herself into trouble for the imaginary sin of cultural appropriation. Now, the singer posted a picture of herself sporting Bantu knots, which is a traditional African hairstyle featuring uh, multiple buns or knots. Adele has presumably worn many hairstyles over the years. All of those styles have origins somewhere. It's doubtful that any of them originate in modern Britain. Is she supposed to check an encyclopedia every time she wants to put her hair up to ensure that she doesn't fashion it in a way that bears similarity to hairstyles worn by non-white people? Apparently so. Racial justice demands it. It's really not so much to ask when you think about it. So as, uh, as cities burn and our country deals with multiple major crises at once, our friends on the left you know, still had time to worry about the way a woman across the ocean decided to fashion her hair. Ernest Owens, a self-described award-winning journalist and rich guy on the Forbes list, spoke out valiantly on this important issue. He said, um, if 2020 couldn't get any more bizarre, Adele is giving us banned two knots and cultural appropriation that nobody asked for. This officially marks all of the top women in pop as problematic. Now, Owens, an alleged grown man, is himself appropriating from 19-year-old pink-haired gender studies majors by calling an utterly innocuous thing problematic. Also, I didn't realize that people had to ask for a certain hairstyle before we're allowed to wear it. Like, who, who, sh who should we ask before we wear I, I, Are we supposed to be asking Ernest Owens every morning as you comb your hair? Just shoot a quick message to Owens. Explain what style you're thinking of going with for the day and, you know, wait for him to give you the go-ahead. I mean, he has to ask you to wear it before... You're allowed to wear it. Other luminaries like Jamil Hill, last seen while claiming that the United States is analogous to Nazi Germany, you might remember that from last week, um, also swooped in to deliver a scolding to a woman who wore too many buns in her hair. I mean, I, I assume that is the problem here. It's too many buns, not the bun itself, because ancient Greeks wore buns. Yes, I actually did look this up. Um, I mean, it's safe to assume even that you know many people in ancient times probably wore hairstyles that included multiple buns. So... The age-old question, how many buns can Adele have before she becomes racist? What is the bun threshold? Now, I counted nine visible buns. Yes, I did count. Would she be racist with just five buns? What about six? And by the way, are we certain that the nine or ten bun style originates with African women? I mean, do we know that no other culture anywhere on earth ever thought of doing that many buns? These are questions that the appropriation police never answer. Can't answer. Uh, Left-wing bloggers also leapt into action, uh, thankfully. A writer for the website The Root wrote a lengthy article on the issue of Adele's hair, and she lamented that the singer you know, would do something so callous as to put her hair in a bun when Adele has been, says the writer, up to this point, among the least problematic faves of the Caucasian persuasion. Now, one might argue that labeling someone a least problematic fave of a certain race is far more racist than wearing too many buns in your hair. But what do I know? Rebecca Fishbein over at uh, Jezebel proved that she's one of the good white people by joining the pile on, quoting from an Instagram commenter. This is a comment from the, from the person on Instagram. Apparently, this is a good point. Black women are discriminated against for wearing cultural hairstyles like Bantu knots and locks, but white people are not. That's not fair, and that's why people are pissed off. But isn't Adele being discriminated against right now? Has any black woman ever been criticized in publication, publications across the entire globe for wearing her hair in a bun? And even if some black women have been discriminated against for wearing the hairstyle, why exactly does that mean other people can't wear it? We're told that some people of one race are discriminated against for wearing something, and therefore people of another race shouldn't wear it. But we seem to have leapfrogged over a few of the steps in this logical progression, because there's no apparent connection between the premise and the conclusion. And no one has ever tried to explain what the connection would be. The problem here, and the reason why the appropriation police can never quite explain what, what appropriation is and why it's wrong and why any of this matters, is that the whole concept is meaningless. I mean, you would think that the people who love to see everything as fluid and on a spectrum and a human construct would understand that culture is, by definition, the most fluid human construct of all. Culture is simply the customs, traditions, arts, and institutions of any group of people. And those customs, traditions, arts, and institutions are always evolving and changing. Uh, and they're in constant exchange with other cultures. In this era of global connectivity, that process is in hyperdrive. It happens quicker. 
and more efficiently. This is why, even if it made sense to accuse one culture of stealing you know, a style from another culture, which it doesn't because theft deprives the victim of the thing being stolen, but nobody's being prevented from wearing buns just because Adele was wearing them. You know, as if there's some sort of scarcity of buns and Adele is hogging more than her share. Um, but even so, you know, even if it made sense, we still couldn't identify who is actually guilty of stealing from whom. Humans have been making culture in some form or another for tens of thousands of years. For, you know, for most trends and fashions, therefore, it's not possible to identify a definitive date or place of origin. Even if you could, what influenced the person who came up with it? And what influenced the influences of that person? And so on and so on and so on. This problem was, was illustrated recently when a white business owner in Seattle was forced to issue an apology for wearing dreadlocks, which supposedly appropriated from African culture too. But dreadlocks have been worn all throughout history by people of all different races and cultures and traditions. Vikings wore dreadlocks. Hindus wore, still wear dreadlocks. Who owns them? Answer, nobody. Because style is not a thing that can be owned. We might as well say that whoever first baked a loaf of bread now owns the concept of bread, and only the direct descendants of that person uh, are allowed to experience its joys, which are considerable. Of course, you know, I'm trying to engage with the concept of cultural appropriation honestly and logically, which means I'm missing the point. It is not supposed to make sense. It is simply supposed to be accepted and obeyed. It is just another means of controlling people and sowing division and discord in a society that I would say already has a surplus of both. And that is why Adele's cancelers are canceled, and, and everyone who uses the phrase cultural appropriation unironically is also canceled. That'll do it for today. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Danny D'Amico, and our audio is mixed by Robin Fenderson. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me, Andrew Claven.